I'm always very grateful when I hear her voice. Okay. Alrighty, so welcome to the Enrique's Journey Writing Lab and Socratic Seminar. Uh, Mrs. Yeah. Campbell, we can't see the screen anymore. <sighs> okay, how about you guys just follow along on the, um, uh, you guys should all have the slides. And Mr. Short, I sent you the link before, correct? Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, wait, did I... I forgot to do this part. Maybe I can do this. Okay. Oh my goodness. You ever have one of those days? <laughs> Today is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've I've had those. Okay. Your entire screen. There. 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 Now can you see it? <laughs> yes. All righty. So before this goes any, gets any more trouble here, let's just move on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. So what did you think of the message in this book? So just, just, I just wanted to kind of start off with your first general impressions of the book. What did you think of the book? Are you there? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. I'm going to have to start calling on people. <laughs> Julian, what did you think of the book? Julian says he can't turn his mic on. Okay. Tara, can you turn your mic on? She says her mic won't turn on either. Why won't your mics work? <laughs> this is going to be some kind of a, a session, I would think. Um, okay, well, Mr. Short, what did you think of the, the story? I'm sorry, I'm chewing some Halloween candy right now. <laughs> 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 um, well, you know... It was um, a story that struck me as being one that was about the human condition, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the sense that it's really about all those things that we all feel so, um, I don't know, fervent about, like, um, love and... Um, Mm -hmm. wanting to be with our loved ones and uh, you know what we'll do what we'll go through in order to realize those desires right and I think too the the real purpose of this you know the, and especially in the last couple of years where there's been so much negative talk about immigrants um, I think that Nazario really wanted to put the human touch to it, uh, the way she starts the book with talking with Carmen and um, how her, you know, she's, she has four other children she's hard, she's never seen in several years, you know. Um, when you think about that, of, of how horrific that must be to kind of basically give up your children so that you can support them. Um, that it it really does put the human touch to the to um, this issue that people say a lot of things that they first of all don't have proof about, and second they don't um, really understand the situations of what would make somebody go through what they do uh, to to take that kind of a journey. So um, have Naomi or Julian or Tara written anything yet? Just that their mics won't turn on. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and um, questions you still have about the book. Was there anything that you uh, were still confused about or didn't quite understand as you were reading through it? Thank you. 
Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's letting me turn it on now. Okay. Yay! Hi, Tara. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question again? Well, what, what questions do you still have about the book? Uh, well, I was wondering, like, well, honestly, actually, I didn't really wonder much. I, it really explained everything in depth. But I, I really wanted to know, like, what was going on inside their head the entire time because it kind of was, like, a third person kind of thing right. mm -hmm. when it's meant to in, in a way be inside it's like it's uh you know it's supposed to be about them like i would want to see more inside their head you know mm -hmm. yeah i know um i know that she did add some of that to the afterward and um you know what where they they were at but that was as of 2013 um and I th and and I tried to look up to see if there was anything more recent that she had posted about um, Enrique and his family, but there wasn't anything there. So um, you know, we it, I know that um, what she had said. In fact, she was th this book was the one book one Bakersfield uh, choice back in 2014, and um, I actually got to meet. Sonia Nazario and we we heard from her and she had said you know he's Enrique is not the poster child he knows he's made mistakes he he knows that yeah he probably made some bad choices as a child and he really thinks that immigration is a bad thing and so he um uh and but but they get along you know but it does seem like what kind of a relationship would they have had had she stayed at home how would this have turned out differently there's really no way to know so good question yeah. also in the t in the text thing right mm -hmm. uh, have you tried have you tried uh, scrolling down to see it because we did write some things but i'm not sure if you're seeing them i, I, have I to can't scroll down. yeah i can't see uh, them so do yeah, you, i had to scroll down okay to see it okay what what what's there uh, well, the the first question, like what the story was about, we some some of us did answer that, so I'm not sure if you saw that or not. Okay, and so it, and that actually is a really good question because there's there was some confusion as what this story actually is about. You would think, on the one hand, that it's just about this boy who who tries to go back and see his mother, but that isn't. Um, and it does say that's the subtitle the true story of a boy determined to reunite with his mother but it goes beyond that because there's a message beyond the story what's that message beyond the story i wrote that i thought the story was about sacrifice right yes. like weighing options wanting to be around either wanting to be around our family or ha being able to give them as many opportunities as possible exactly yeah and it all comes down to the immigration issue so it's giving us a, 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 a kind of an explanation in just one aspect of why people uh, come to the United States okay um, so this was one of the first discussion questions that you've addressed Enrique and Lourdes disagree about the impact of immigration on the United States. Enrique says that were he an American citizen, he would want to restrict illegal immigration. Like most on his paint crew, he explains, he gets paid cash under the table, which is to say he does not contribute taxes on what he earns. He uses publicly provided services, including emergency medical aid, and he sends a portion of his income to Honduras rather than spending it in his community. Lourdes disagrees. To her, immigrant labor is the engine that helps drive the American economy. Immigrants like her, she says, work hard at jobs no American wants to do, at least not for minimum wage, provides good services, goods and services to all Americans at reasonable prices, she says. So with whom do you agree with more and why? Uh, I kind of wrote that I, I was in between almost, you know, because mm -hmm. I see both. I see both sides of it, and I consider myself pretty neutral on it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because Enrique, right, he, he is right to a point because, you know, if if everybody just was got paid under the table like he did and didn't contribute taxes, that would be a lot of, if a large portion of people did, then that would be really bad for the economy. Mm -hmm. But Lourdes is also right because immigrants are, are practically the basis of the economy, you know, right? because they do 
do uh, the jo- jobs that no other American wants to do, like she said. You mm-hmm. know? And they do provide really cheap goods and services. So, honestly, I see both sides of it. All right. Now that the uh, when these questions were written, the minimum wage was still lower. But now that minimum wage has been increased in most states, and I don't know, do any of you know what the minimum wage rate is in California? Isn't it supposed to be like $15 soon? Well, I don't know if, I know soon, yeah. I don't think it's actually reached 15 yet. Um, probably I should. 12. 12? Okay. So, um, and that is up quite a bit. Um, because I think it had been at one point something like eight something. And so when you think about, this is why, you know, when students say, well, I'll just get a job when I, you know, you know, I can get a job, I can get money. And the thing is, there are so many people who are after those minimum wage jobs that they, it, and the way that the companies have to kind of save money when they're paying these kinds of wages is by only giving Mm -hmm. people a few hours a week. So, you know, really 40 hours should be what you were looking for, but you may only be getting 15 to 20 hours a week. And, and then you have to get another job and then that becomes more stressful on you. So it is really impacting the, the community. And the very reason why the minimum wage was raised was because there's, there's a lot of people trying to support families on that money and they can't do it on, you know, the eight something, even at the 12 something, it, there, it takes a lot to make ends meet. So, um, but I think is, is it, are there jobs out there that you think only the immigrants would do? Has anybody had experience out there in the fields? or packing well Naomi can you hear me yeah okay Naomi says in her chat uh, I agree with Lord's companies use a desperation and fear of these immigrants to get jobs done and only paying them little money yeah and they are they're also working with the vulnerable um, if you're interested in this topic there's a fiction story called um, what is that tortilla Oh, what is that story called? Um, you know, the one I'm talking about, Mr. Short, Tortilla, the, it's, it's about, it, it, um, it's a story about a, a man who, you know, he, he's, he's a white guy who's saying all these things about immigrants and whatnot. And then one day, in the same, at the same time, there's a parallel story about a man trying to support his pregnant wife who's just come over the border. And one day, the white man hits the uh, immigrant and just kind of said, oh, are you okay? Maybe I should take you to the hospital, whatnot. And the man says, no, 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 no. I, I'm going to go now. And so this man is trying so hard to, to get kind of like w- to deal with this because he knows that this man cannot go and get help. He, um, he's, and he tries to find him to give him some money and the guy won't take any. So it's really an interesting story about how we view each other. So have you, do you know the story I'm talking about? No, I don't. Okay. No, I've never heard of it. Um, don't look on it. Uh, I'll look it up later. <clears throat> but it's <laughs> if you're interested, let me know. Say, what's that book about the tortillas, Ms. Campbell? Um, it, it's not literally about tortillas. It's about uh, kind of like a community, more or less. Okay, um, the second question was, how does the issue of immigration impact the various stakeholders listed below? So let's start with immigrant parents, especially in this uh, situation where it's the parents themselves that are the immigrants, that they're the ones coming into the United States to try and get some resources for their family. How does immigration impact them? So is this like with or without their kids coming into the country? It would be without them. Okay. Uh, well, 
one, you know, they'd have to face, like, a lot of racism here, which, you know, Mm -hmm. is absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. They would also have to handle the fact that they're separated from their kids, even though I seriously doubt that they really wanted to, you know? Right. Uh, And, you know, them getting and getting a job here, you know, is really hard for anyone, you know, especially for immigrants, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. So I'm sure, like, they would feel hopeless at some points. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. I was going to say they feel scared <clears throat> because, like, they could come here not knowing if they're going to get a job or not, something like that. Right. Um, and I, I wonder if they realize just how hard it is to get the jobs here. Um, you know, I... I I know it's hard just for somebody looking for work who, you know, who, who's lived here and they have an education and everything. It's hard to get a job because there's so many uh, people who need them. I agree with you, Ms. Mrs. Campbell. I think that a lot of them um, may get clouded judgment of that America is um, land of the free and they don't really realize that it's a lot harder here because they don't have a lot of options because they are illegal. Right. Does anybody know why the uh, children were separated from their parents at the border? You know how we, I, I don't know if you've seen that in the news about how oh, we, yeah. yeah. Do, do you know what the situation was there? It's because the kids were born here. So they're, they're legal. And right. They're legal. They are citizens, but since their parents aren't, you know, right. And the kids can't go back over the border because then they would be illegal in, in like in, whatever country the parents came from, you know. Right, right. So, ha, what? I mean, what do we do about that? What? How does that impact the children of the immigrants? I feel like they would probably get put into foster care unless they have any other family um, there that are legal citizens. Hmm. Yeah. Which is probably terrifying for them to see their parents ripped away from them. Right. I mean, there, there's been some heartbreaking photographs that, um, I don't know if you've seen the one where the little toddler is, is looking up at the mom, the mom's in handcuffs, and uh, that that's just a heart-wrenching photograph that tells the story so well. Um Now, there are children going the opposite way. So we do have, uh, you know, the parents who've crossed, and now we have the children going after them. So if we look at those children, how does the issue impact them? Um, I remember in the afterward, it talked about um, a school counselor who basically talked to migrants or uh, immigrant children who had come to America to see their parents and they basically had like a huge um, resentment towards their parents mm-hmm. because from a child's point of view, all they want is their parents. And I think that most of the time they don't really understand why the parents did it and what drove the parents to leave them. I think most of them are just like, why did you leave me? Mm-hmm. And so it kind of, um, especially with Lourdes and Enrique, she was just like, mad at him because he didn't respect what she had to do for him and all of her other children and he was just really upset at her because he left her Mm -hmm. and didn't understand why (laughs) i actually remember that uh that section in the afterward about the school right Mm -hmm. uh it talked about the outcomes for the for a lot of the children how the graduation rate was kind of low you know how a lot of them would join uh, end up joining gangs or like get pregnant too early, you know, when the, before they're ready, you know. Right. And there's lots of reasons why that happens. Did it mention why we're looking at that? I mean, what what's what what are the causes of all of these things that they get into? Remember it talking about students coming in not knowing English for one thing? There's um, 
most of the time, now, it, especially in California, we've been able to really champion bilingual education. So for the students who, whose primary language is Spanish, um, we've been able to provide them with education in both Spanish and English, teaching them the core stuff in, in Spanish, and then adding English to it so that they can just transfer those skills uh, from Spanish to English. Um, the problem is not a lot of schools know how to deal with that. Um, while the teachers in California are supposed to be trained in how to deal with sp uh, speakers who struggle in English, we still, you know, it takes five to seven years to completely get involved in the language so that you can read and write academically in it. And yet the other thing we do is we subject them to the same tests that we subject all the other students to. And so the, the so one thing is that they're not going to succeed in school. They're not going to graduate at the rate that everybody else does. Um, what about gangs? Why do you think that the that some of them join gangs? Well, maybe because they come into the country with not a lot of funds. So possibly they don't live in the best area. And because maybe they have not a great relationship with their parent and they're not so great in school, it's possibly easy for them to find a gang and join and kind of put all of their anger and resentment into that and mm -hmm. focus in that instead of focusing on their feelings towards their parents. Right. Anything else that might lead them to a gang? Maybe they were like born into one. Right. That they're kind of, it's kind of inherited that, you know, the big brother is and the, um, the dad was. Yeah. Um, I don't know what that was. <laughs> is everybody there still? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, um, what was my last question? <laughs> That threw me off. That sound threw me off. <laughs> um, children of immigrants. Oh, why they're in? Why they move into gangs? <clears throat> and um, Julian was you was telling us what it was. Well, yeah, I said that they could have like be they uh, could have been born into into one. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, and that that is exactly it. They it's a it's an established community, and in fact, it is their family. Even if their parents are not there, uh, a gang is a family. You get the acceptance, you get the um, uh, affirmation, you know, the, then that's why they join gangs is to, to be accepted and to feel like they're part of something. And so the children of the immigrants do that as well. Could there be any possible other reasons why um, children go astray when they are left alone? Because they have nobody to guide them, no model to look right. To copy, almost. Unless it is the gang members, there's nobody to look up to. Now, Enrique had his grandmother. And what impressions did you get of the grandmother? I felt like she tried her hardest to raise him. Yeah. But eventually, when he started growing up and becoming like into drugs, you know, uh, yeah. and started to kind of go a bad path. Uh, she she didn't know how to handle them anymore because it did say that she was getting she's old, she's older. You know, she didn't know how to handle that anymore. Yeah, and she's you know she ra she already raised one child, <laughs> and um, it is difficult to raise that second child. So, okay. Um, American workers. How does the immigration issue impact American workers? We kind of already discussed it, haven't we?
what is the what is the general impression out there from what you hear based on what you hear from adults around you how do you think they're they're being impacted or what are they saying about how they're being impacted a lot of people say i'm not sure if it's true you know because mm -hmm. i don't know much i don't i don't know much about this particular part mm -hmm. But a lot of people do say, like, oh, they're taking our jobs and stuff like that. Do you think that's um, true? I, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I agree with you, Tara. Um, I feel like when they say that, I think they just use that as a way of um, being, I guess, racist, but, like, um, trying to find the right word not fully like out there yeah because in a way um they're not really taking all of our jobs because mostly they don't have enough options mm -hmm. with american citizens we have a lot more especially if we have um any type of school background even from like high school we still have a lot more options with that and with immigrants they really don't they have like the lowest paying anything in just any company that will hire them and so in a way it doesn't it affects the work american workers but only those who are wanting like to do the lowest of the lowest jobs right now, another thing you want to consider too is what uh like with enrique so enrique gets paid under the table to do the painting that means that whoever's having the work done so the, the, the contractor says, oh, we can get this job done in three days and it's only going to cost you $1,000 because he knows he's only going to pay Enrique, you know, like a hundred. Um, and he doesn't have to pay health insurance. He doesn't have to pay taxes. Um, so when that happens, then the people who, you know, they're, they work for a painting company and the contractor who has the bid and he does cover, you know, the, the appropriate salaries and, and insurance and taxes. He can't afford to, to bid that low because he's got to pay his employees what they're getting. And so that's why there's a big to do when they find out that some of these politicians um, have hired, and it's the very reason that Nazario has Carmen to begin with. You know, she's she's paying her. She's not paying her under any kind of contract or any kind of um, bargaining. She pays her to to do the work, and and um, I think it says she doesn't even pay the the employment taxes uh, for her, and and no health care, but. Um, and so that's part of where the resentment comes, is that when they're being paid as cheap labor, then the people who, this is how they make their living, they can't make their living. Okay, border patrol officers. Do any of you, uh, do any of you have um, law enforcement in your family? My sister wanted to be a police officer, but she never... Uh... My uncle is a police officer, but he lives in North Dakota. Oh, yeah. I don't think he has too many calls on immigrants there, right? Yeah. <laughs> or does he? <laughs> if they are, they're Canadians. Um, <laughs> um, it, but it certainly, even in North Dakota, law enforcement is not an easy job, right? Yeah. And <clears throat> so what is the big... Why... What is the job of the border patrol officer? Why are they uh, keeping people out? Because they, they're coming in illegally? Is that why they're they're doing what they're doing? Border patrol officers are just doing their job, really. I'm sure a lot of them, you know, have varying opinions on the on the subject, just they're doing their job. They're doing they their job. Keep, they have to keep uh, the they have to keep people from coming in who are not legal to come in, you know? Yeah. And, and the primary reason, whether it's legitimate or not, is that it could prov 
it could be a safety risk because if we don't vet the people who come in, it's very likely that we'll let somebody in who's a criminal. And, and that's one of the biggest complaints. The problem is everybody thinks everybody else is a criminal. But can, how, what are the numbers of immigrants? Do you, can, can we take a look and figure out what was one of the numbers that Nazario put out on how many uh, are coming in? Um, it says on page five, since 1990, more than 11 million immigrants arrived illegally. Since 2000, a million additional immigrants annually on average have arrived illegally or legally or become legal residents. Okay. So that means that that second, the, the ones who've arrived legally and become legal residents, the government's gone through and they figured out these are good productive citizens. We don't have anything to worry about. So we'll take them out. Um, so the 11 million that have arrived illegally, you have to figure that are all of them going to be educated, productive, and law-abiding citizens? Probably not. There probably will be some. We just never know how many. And that's why we, uh, that's why it becomes a safety issue at the border and there have been some people who have injured or even killed border patrol officers or who have come through and and have been involved in crimes that have involved the injury or death of american citizens so we can understand why they what their job is but does nazario paint it that way uh no you know, I don't think she's very sympathetic towards the Border Patrol officers. I'm sure there are a lot of bad ones, but for the most part, I think a lot of them are just doing their job, and she she's not being very understanding of their side of the issue either, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that you, if you look at, do you remember the lists you made of uh, the loaded language? Um, I don't know if you can bring that up, but... Um, the reason we had you do that activity was so that, you know, if this is the way you want to go, you have proof as to how Nazario kind of paints that picture where things are, she, she, it's very negative. What are some of the things she says about Border Patrol officers? Do you remember? She calls them, I, I, uh, I can't find it in the book right now, but like I, she would use like really bad language relating to them, almost uh, like um, kind of like synonyms of ruthless, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, unfeeling almost. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, well, I guess that's not so bad. I'm looking at the beginning of chapter six on page 117. It says, you are in American territory, a border patrol agent shouts through a bullhorn. Turn back. Sometimes Enrique strips and wades into the Rio Grande to cool off and wash away the sweat and grime, but the bullhorn always stops him. He goes back. Thank you for returning to your country. Enrique is stymied. For days he has been stuck in Nuevo Laredo. He has been watching, listening, and trying to plan. Somewhere across this milky green ribbon of water is his mother. Enrique embraces the campsite as his temporary new home. It is safer for him than anywhere else in Nuevo Laredo, a city a half a of a half a million residents. It is swarming with La, La Migra and all kinds of police. The camp is at the bottom of a narrow winding path that slopes to the river. A clump of weeds, reeds hides it from the U.S. immigration authorities' constant surveillance. That kind of sounds neutral to me. What do you think? Is there anything that kind of sounds a little strong for what she's describing there? And that and that that part no, I don't think so. Okay. I think that sounds fairly neutral. Yeah. 
but there are several things that she has said and and certainly the the pictures don't help so those pictures like the one i i told you about with the child looking up at its mother's or her mother's in handcuffs uh those are meant to paint paint that that negative picture and so that but so when you want to if you're if you're talking about the language that she's using that loaded language you want to make sure to go back to that assignment where you pulled that out because you need to show how she does that okay so speaking of the book and evidence there are some questions here that um, we need to find where the evidence is uh, because it's possible that you may be using some of these within your response to the writing. So um, take a look at this list and see if you can pinpoint where you see evidence of this. So the first question is, why did Lourdes feel justified in leaving her family? Where do you think you're going to find that? On page 20, mm -hmm. it says, um, Lourdes can think of only one place that offers hope. Good. As Now, I then, continue okay. reading that pa paragraph, Naomi. Okay. As a seven-year-old child, she glimpsed this place on other people's television screens when she would deliver her mother's homemade tortillas to wealthy homes. On television, she saw New York City's spectacular skyline, Las Vegas shimmering lights, Disneyland's magic castle. The flickering images were a far cry from Lourdes' childhood home. A two-room shack made of wooden slats with a flimsy tin roof. The bathroom was a clump of bushes outside. Well done. Thank you for reading that. I want us to process this because I think it's really important in the overall discussion as to why people come to the United States. Why? What is Nosario trying to tell us about by giving us what she sees here in this other person's home? That they Lourdes doesn't have a good life and she or not a good life but she didn't have a good childhood in the sense of her surroundings and that she wants possibly a better life for her children right now as americans who have lived here our, all our lives is that what america really is not for everyone. I feel like some people are more privileged than others. Um, even some people in America have similar lives to Lourdes, maybe. People who are homeless or don't have a lot of income, so they don't have necessarily a big house or, or at least a room to live in. Not I'm not asking actually for an answer right now, so think of this rhetorically. Oh. But no, no, I I wanted that answer. I'm moving to a new oh. question now. <laughs> think about your own life. Is your life like the lives that are depicted on television today? I mean, that's what you yeah. have to think about. When you're talking, Naomi, about who actually has this kind of lifestyle, how many people are we talking about here? What percentage of the population? What do you think? Um, like the top 1%. Okay. And that's why they talk about it, right? I don't, have you heard about the top 1% and the 99%? that the top 1% are the ones that hold most of the wealth in this country and it's the 99% that um, works hard and lives under that um, kind of that uh, the good life basically. 
Mm-hmm. So that that becomes important when you think about it. When and now she the first thing she's had to do is she's had to go into people's homes that, in um, Honduras where they have the money to have a TV. I mean, she's never have a, had a TV. So first of all, she's going into those wealthy homes that have the televisions. Now the televisions are getting, are picking up American television programs and look at what they're showing. I mean, who wouldn't want to go there? It's like, um, have you seen the commercials for, what is it, Sandals, the, the beach resorts in, in the Caribbean? the Caribbean. I mean, I'd love to go there. That looks great. I I know I could have a great time there. I certainly don't have the money to get there. And trying to hop a train to get over there is not going to be a a good idea. But this is what Lourdes is looking at. She's looking at, um, there's a, there's a source there of wealth of, of something. And maybe she thinks she can get just a little bit of that to send to her family. Good. That's a great paragraph. Make sure that you write that number down. Now, why wasn't Enrique satisfied with staying with his grandmother? Where can we find that one? Actually, I already found the page to that one. Perfect. I already found the page to that one, actually. Good. Go ahead. What is it? Um, on page 23, right okay. at the bottom, it says, On Mother's Day, he makes a heart-shaped card at school and presses it into Maria's hand. I love you very much, Grandma, he writes. But she is, but she is not his mother, right? And, and it goes over into page twenty-four, right? And then especially, uh, so Grandmother Maria really gives us some Im- insight into him, Enrique's father. Uh, and this is the other contrast because remember, as I recall, that this is the mother of his father, correct? Grandmother Maria is Enrique's father's mother. Do we? Uh, I'm pretty sure that's who it is. I, I, as I recall, it's it. Um, but he plans to move and plans to moves in with her and leaves Enrique with Grandmother Maria. It would make sense for him to to leave Enrique with his mother rather than Lourdes's mother. Um, he begs his father to let him come along. Why do you think that he would prefer to be with his dad? Because it's the last parent he has. Mm-hmm. It's the last connected parent that he has, and the grandmother is not it. He he's already been abandoned by mom. He doesn't want to be abandoned by dad. So, of course, he's going to have some animosity towards the grandmother, not because he doesn't love her, but because the other two parents have left him, and he kind of takes it out on her. Excellent. Why do you think Belky was more accepting of her mother's abandonment? One of the things I'm doing is I'm also kind of looking through, uh, in that rebellion stage, I'm looking at the subtitles, I'm also scanning for Belky's name. Take a look at 49. Not sure that's quite what I was looking have for. <laughs> Hi, Mrs. Campbell. I have a student who just came in. That I'm going to work with for a while, so All I'll right. be out of the. Okay. Wait. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Bye. I was looking for. Um, she doesn't want Enrique to leave. She's hardly seen Enrique, so that's what happens on forty-nine. Where else can we find out about Belky? (laughs) 
I think I found something. Excellent. Where? On page 24, it says, On Mother's Day, Belky cries quietly alone in her room. She struggles through the celebrations at school. Then she scolds herself. She should thank her mother for leaving. Without the money Lourdes sends for books and uniforms, Belky could not even attend school. She reminds herself of all the other things her mother ships south. Rebook tennis shoes, black sandals, the yellow bear, and pink puppy stuffed toys on her bed. She finds comfort in a friend whose mother has also left for the States. She and her friend know a girl whose mother died of a heart attack. At least, they say, our moms are alive. Excellent. Uh, I think that really works. But what we need now is to make the connection. How does this show why uh, Belki is more accepting? This is known as analysis. <laughs> That's why it's hard. Uh, it it kind of shows that Belki has a different mindset than Enrique does. How Enrique so? Enrique's just mad at his mother for leaving. Because right. Enrique's just mad at his mother for leaving, right? Right. But Bel Belki sees the good side of it. Like, she gets to go to school and she has an opportunity for a good job in the future, you know? Yeah. Now, keep in mind, too, this is probably due to what factor? Why but why does Belki realize that the mother did what she needed to do, whereas Enrique doesn't? She has kind of a support system. Like her friend like I said, she has a friend whose mother is left for the States. Very good. Yes, she has she's and, made her own support and And other people say that their mom they say that their moms are alive because a lot of other people's moms aren't. Right. And that's it. That's what the support system has done. They've figured out the moms are alive. They're just not there. But there's a reason why Belki is able to even contemplate the reasons that her mother leaves. What is that reason? It, is it because she still lives with Lorda's family? That's a good, that, yes, that's a good point. And I hadn't thought of that. That wasn't the one I'm thinking of. But yes, she's still connected more to Lourdes' family than Enrique is because he's staying with his dad's family. Mm -hmm. And there's one other factor. It's very simple. I'll send it telepathically, see if anybody picks it up. <laughs> Belki is blank than Enrique. Older? Yes. She's older. She's the older sister. And I, uh, what do you think? Do you think the fact that she's older plays a fa uh, part in this? Maybe she has more mem memories of her mother. Right. So, and, and how she's older, so she can just understand better. So how old was she when Lourdes left? I have to do some math here. How much older is Belki than Enrique? Uh, Elke was seven when mm -hmm. Lourdes left. So she's two years older than Enrique. So if you think of the difference between five years old and seven years old, and I don't know if you can rem remember that far back. <laughs> I know I certainly can't now. But um, what there is a big difference. There's a big difference. Yeah. So she has a little bit more maturity, and especially on this Mother's Day, where now it's two years after the mother left. So now Belki is nine years old. So she's able to put these pieces together. When um, when she leaves, when Enrique is five, and, and that's why that chapter starts as it does. The boy does not understand. I think that's a really powerful opening sentence because that's what we have to, the, when she left, he's not old enough to understand. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. What did the children lose when their mother left? This one is more um, 
I mean, it's 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 more having to do with not tangible things, but what do what do they lose when the mother leaves? Actually, it's kind of mentioned in the prologue a little bit, not mm -hmm. necessarily relating to Lourdes and Enrique and Belki, but like Carmen, right? Okay, go ahead. It says her son Minor, right? Mm -hmm. Is that how you pronounce? Is that how you pronounce it? What pay, right. Minor? Yeah, Minor. Yeah, okay, because uh, okay. he says you have it all: good clothes, good tennis. On page three, it says you have you have it all: good clothes, good tennis suit, tennis shoes. It says I traded all for my mother. I never had someone to spoil me to say don't do this. Don't do that. Have you eaten? You can never get the love of a mother from someone else. Excellent. Perfect. That works and you can apply it because we can, since this is the same situation, um, uh, you can make that inference. It's an ec that's excellent. Making those two points connect. Um, also said little things like on page 27 and Enrique longs to hear Lord, this is voice even the voice of his mother. Um, there's things that, so so a lot of those are going to be what's missing. Uh, she'll she'll tell more specifically what's missing and then you can just make it, she's, she's taken that with her. Okay, um, describe the guilt Lourdes feels when she leaves her children. Where do we find that? There's one specific thing that t gives us all the information we need. When it comes to saying goodbye, what does she do with Enrique? She doesn't say bye to him. She can't face him. And so that is showing, um, you know, she she doesn't even say goodbye to him to the point where what she walks away. Donde está mi mamá? Don't mi mami. Um, and she her his mother never returns to Central America, so she can't even in herself accept the fact that she's having to do this, and that is going to plant that seed of resentment. <coughs> So make sure you mark that one too, 221. Okay, what is the evidence from Aunt Rosa Amalia sites that proves the separation from their mother has caused Enrique and Belki deep emotional wounds? Where are we gonna find that one? On page 24 also, it says, um, Aunt Rosa Amelia thinks the separation has caused Belki and Enrique deep emotional problems. To her, it seems that they struggle with an unavoidable question. How can I be worth anything if my own mother left me? Ooh, that's it. That's the winner right there. How can I be worth anything if my own mother left me? How does that question impact you? What, what do you make of that question? I feel like for Enrique and Belki, especially at such a young age, they 
Belki understands some of it, but I think that maybe they don't understand all of it so that it when your parent leaves you, no matter like why they left you, it's just it creates that thing in your mind like if why why would my parent leave me? Mm-hmm. Like they're supposed to love me, they're supposed to nurture me, they're supposed to care for me. Why would they leave me? And I think that in the future, it could kind of cause them to maybe be blocked off from others. Right. Good. Because when they were so young, their parents left them that now they're afraid of whoever they love is going to also leave them. That is really good. I like that, Naomi. Nice job. Um any other thoughts about this? Of course, I feel guilty when I leave my two dogs with somebody, when I, my husband and I go somewhere. Um, you know, if I feel guilty over leaving dogs, I can't imagine what it would feel like um, to be left by your mother and so for me if I were left like that um, it almost puts me in the position like well maybe I'm just their pet I'm only their pet you know have you ever uh, well I'm not going to ask you to actually tell but think about a time where you have felt rejected. Hopefully you haven't, but I get the feeling most of us have, even if it's just, you know, somebody didn't invite us to a birthday party or something like that. But think about how you felt with that rejection. Now imagine if that happened with a parent, how would you feel? And by doing that, if you can connect to a time that you felt rejected, I think maybe you'll have some understanding of what this question is asking. All right, let's take a look at the last question here. What does Enrique... Yeah, it's kind of, Go ahead. What, Tara? Oh, it's kind of like... Um, it's kind of like if uh, your parents are supposed to be the ones who love you and accept you, you know, every, no matter what, right? Right. So if they were to leave, you know, why, why should anybody else... Right. If the ones who are absolutely supposed to and do, you know, mm-hmm. or should, you know. Right. If they left you, why wouldn't anybody else kind of? Yeah. And I get, I get the feeling that that's possibly why it's so easy for Enrique and uh, what's the girlfriend's name where they have the baby? Enrique and uh, oh, what's her name? <laughs> yeah. Who? Uh, mm-hmm. Maria Isabel. Maria Isabel. That's right. Um, and it, you know, it's, no, wait, she doesn't leave. Does she leave? I forget. I know Enrique leaves and it's kind of like, oh, well, um, but Maria Isabel. Yeah, she joins them in America. Yeah, she mm-hmm. does. She joins them in America. Uh-huh. With like their kid. Yeah. Well, she did. Okay. So she takes the baby with her. Right. She doesn't leave the baby behind. No, she leaves the baby, and then, like, two months later, they save up enough to, to bring have them. a... Okay. To get a smuggler. All right. Yeah, I, um... Still, though, why leave your own child? I just... I can't understand that. All right. <clears throat> Oops. Uh, what does Enrique expect from his mother once he has found her? You get a hint. Nazario actually tells you through the chapter name. On page 163, mm-hmm. it says, Children like Enrique dream that when they finally find their mothers, they will live happily ever after. Mm-hmm. 
for weeks, months even, the mothers and children hold on to a fairy tale idea of how they should feel toward one another. Then their true feelings surface. And what do we know about those true feelings? They're angry. Mm -hmm. Resentful, angry, um, rejected, abused. abused. Yes. And that's the thing. It is kind of like a, you know, there's a honeymoon period there where everything's fine and dandy. But when reality sits in, now they've got a lot of stuff that they have to work their way through. Perfect. Mark that page down. 163. That's a good page. Alrighty, so let's take a look at the writing prompt that you're given. <clears throat> Honduran migrant official Noberto Giron is quoted by Nazario as saying, we are seeing a disintegration of the family. Keeping the family together, even if they are poor, is more important than leaving and improving their economic conditions. Do you agree or disagree with his statement? Do you believe that Enrique's life, as well as those of his family, would have been better overall if Lourdes had remained in Honduras rather than going to the United States to provide better financially for her children. Write an essay discussing the extent to which you agree or disagree with this claim. Use evidence from the text to support your argument. So let's break this down. What form, what are you going to produce from this prompt? This is an argument essay. Why is it an argument? What are you, what, what's the argument about? Um, the argument okay. is basically about whether um, it's better for a parent to leave their children and send money back to them or to stay with them. Right. And <clears throat> the actual direct part of the prompt is agreeing or disagreeing with Garon. So is what he's saying true or not? Good. Um, so with the argument essay, what you're going to do is present your opinion based off of the question. So, so you will have to re either rephrase or repeat Garon's argument there, or at least part of it, and then explain how, how much you agree or disagree with that statement. Then you need to explain your position through the evidence with the book. And so that's why we kind of practice going through the book, trying to find this information. So that's what you're going to produce. Now, the function, the product, is to tell your readers whether you agree or disagree with that statement. So within this, um, you need to explain why Lourdes was right or wrong to leave her children to find work in the U.S. Now, it doesn't have to be all about Lourdes. If you want to talk about Carmen, if you want to talk about even Maria Isabel or Enrique himself, um, just where are the, the, the pieces that show that it would have been better or that it actually was better that Lourdes had left? And again, using the evidence from the text to support your opinion. Okay, oh. go ahead. Who had the question? Nobody? Okay. So why is this topic important? What, what, what do we need to really communicate about this topic to an audience? It's important because it affects a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. Like what? Uh, like the like immigrants coming in, you know, their journey here is absolutely just, it's very hard on people. A lot of people die coming here. And then a lot of them, when they do get here, you know, they live in fear daily. Right. And then, of course, there's also the economic issues that some people see with it and, you know, Right. And there's just a lot of different opinions on the subject, and it's really important that people know about it. And where, where, where is that going to go as you respond to this question? Where do you think that would go in an essay, what you just said? Like, no, the issue isn't black and white, almost. You, you could know? say that, right. But where, where do you think you're going to talk about this in your essay? Beginning, middle, end.
Where should it go? Where's the logical spot for it? Like the beginning? Mm -hmm. Right at the beginning. The, yeah. The thesis statement? Yes. And in fact, par any part of this can be used as the hook and saying that, you know, like you said, this is not a black and white issue. There's a lot of things to consider. There's a lot of people who get hurt when somebody is trying to support their family by leaving the family. Okay. Um, so that is the purpose of your essay. That's what you're trying to accomplish. As you said, you people ought to know this. And so if you think of that while you're composing that and you can remember the idea that I'm trying to get people to understand that this is not just what, what it seems on the outset, that there's a lot of heartache that's going behind every, really nobody wants to leave where they were born and raised, right? I mean, um, well, maybe you guys do. <laughs> if you've lived in Bakersfield all your life, you're kind of like, when do I get out of here? But um, <laughs> it's it's still leaving the country. I, I don't think that's ever gotten that bad for any one of us. But that's, that's what you want to set up right away. Okay, let's take a raft. And what I mean by that, it's, this is an acronym. The first R stands for reason. So what is the reason you're writing it? What is the reason you're writing the essay? Don't say because that I signed it to you. <laughs> uh, to state whether we disagree or agree with um, his statement, mm -hmm. Roberto's statement. Right. Now, um, so let's figure it out now. Are you agreeing or disagreeing? Disagreeing. You're disagreeing. Why are you disagreeing, Tara? Because... For example, if Lourdes had stayed with them, mm -hmm. they easily could have ended up in a much worse situation. At least if Lourdes left, right? Mm -hmm. They had the opportunity to like go to college and get a good job like Belky did, you know? Okay. And so the audience needs to know this because? It can give them a different pers perspective on what they think of migrants good. and immigrants. Very good, yes. So um, I think it's okay to use the migrant once they've gotten here. They, they uh, well, no, I think in transit they're migrants. If they have already mm -hmm. been, come in and the action is done, it's immigrant. If they yeah. are leaving, they th are thinking of emigrating with the E. And so that's kind of how you, you know, which one do I use when? Okay. So we need, we need people to understand that, the, that there are things that drive people to, to have immigration and it's not just to steal money and jobs from the United States. Okay. Now the A stands for audience. So without saying the, um, the teacher and the students in the class, who do you want to hear this message? People who are looking for a different opinion on the subject or just trying to form an opinion on the subject. Right. Okay. So probably uh, Americans who, you know, they're, and, and do you think you even want to uh, talk to people who are against illegal immigration? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Even those who are all for immigration should probably let them know things too, because you're going to disagree with it. That, um, well, no, you're going to agree with the fact that Lourdes came. Okay. Um, but even people who are for immigration, then you can argue that, well, you know, you're, you're doing some damage to your child while you're trying to feed and clothe and educate your child. You're still doing damage to that child. Yeah. Okay, form. So we know that it's going to be a what kind of essay? Argumentative. Argumentative. And then the T stands for thesis. So now we got to figure out what's our thesis. It's real easy. This one's super easy. You got two choices. What are they? 
You agree or disagree? Right. With who? Uh, not about that statement. Right. So that's all. That's now. Now, what you do before or after that, what you tack it on to, that's your creativity. That's your style. But that the core of that is going to be agreeing or disagreeing with your own. Excellent. Okay. So um, this is one possible. Um, kind of response to that, no matter the circumstances. Giron is correct when he says that the family needs to stay together. The emotional strain on both parent and child costs more than the lack of three meals a day in clothing. That's one sample that you could, that you can work with if you wanted to. Okay. Now for the second part, the evidence that supports that um, I've constructed here a chunk. Do you guys remember what the chunk was? I've talked before about a chunk. Just want to see if you remember what a chunk is. What's a chunk? Looking at what's there, what do you think a chunk is? like a, a large uh, quote. it's not singly a quote and in fact what you have here is two quotes so the first part um, this part up here after Lourdes has been gone for two years is what we call the lead-in so we're setting up in the book where we're going to pull this from she is able to send the children and here's where I'm picking up the quote. So I don't need the whole sentence. Clothes, shoes, toy cars, a Robocop doll, a television. Notice also how I've cited it. I have put the, um, it's the only thing you're going to need to cite is Nazario anyway. So it's her last name and then the page number. So that's the first piece of evidence. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to support why I, you know, basically tell why I'm, pointing this quote out. So working in the United States allows Lourdes to send financial support to her children. But, and this comes from the book too, and I forgot to cite it, and I would take points off myself. Uh, but Enrique's grandmother will continues to tell him his mother will, quote, be home soon. I think the reason I didn't is that you can find this plenty of times. I mean, how many times does she tell Enrique, she'll be home, she'll be home, um, but she never does come home. And that's what the, so the second part here is the uh, actual um, statement of that. She doesn't come home and that only makes Enrique angrier. So that is a chunk. Here's a second chunk. So Lourdes' motivation to leave Tegucigalpa was to give a better life to her children. But when Enrique finally reaches her 11 years later, here's the part that's from the book. He confesses to her how he sold the items she sent to him in order to buy glue to get high. She realizes her mistake. She cries. And then, here's the part that's actually quoted, she feels too guilty to go on. And then that's cited. So Enrique convinces her that he did not need the clothes and the shoes and the gifts. He needed her. You put these two chunks together and that's going to be your body paragraph. So it's a two chunk body paragraph. So here's your organization on how this is going to look. Yes, you can make each of these a paragraph. You can go more if you want to. This is format only. If you, if you want to be a little bit more free in your writing, you don't have to kind of structure it like this. This is just offered as a suggestion. So the introduction includes the hook and the claim, and that hook is going to be why this topic is important. And then you have your claim. You do not have to quote the entire Garon quote. You can take the pieces of it, um, just the pieces that matter. The same is true for whatever quotes you're pulling in from the book. You don't need the complete sentence. What you do need to do is make that sentence fit the structure of your sentence. So you've got one reason body paragraph, a second reason body paragraph, and then the fourth one is if you can think of a possible solution, what, what should we do 
is is there one little step we can do to kind of solve this immigration dilemma that this country has? What would you suggest? I would suggest suggest like family planning in those countries that have high immigration rates. Okay. Because uh. I mentioned in the afterward that a lot of the people coming over right now are kids finding their mothers, like in the book. Mm -hmm. So maybe if family planning was more prevalent, almost. Yeah. Now, what you would have to think about, and, and it would be more research, but I think it's a perfectly good suggestion, is how they view family planning in those countries. Because especially if it's a, very, a highly uh, Catholic area, um, they, they don't agree with, with using birth control. And so that, um, that can become part of the dilemma. The other part of, of the dilemma is that birth control does cost money. And if you don't have it, you know, how can you use it? So, but again, that comes in, you know, these are some, some considerations. However, we have to control the number of people trying to come over. I think that's a perfectly legitimate argument that works really well. Is there another suggestion that, that anybody can think of how we might be able to just address the problem? What is it they need in those countries besides family planning? What is it? What? Why can't? Why does she need to leave to begin with? What do they need? Jobs. They need more income. Mm -hmm. More income. So possibly, um, allowing more, depending where they live, having more availability to get jobs. Right. And. Um, at least to grow their own food. Why are they not yeah. able to get to, to grow their own food? Did, they, did, you re, did, did you come across that in your reading? Um. What do you know about Honduras itself, the country itself? Uh. It's a really poor country. Mm -hmm. Be, and it's and it's actually um, the thing about it has the high, go it ahead. Has the highest murder rate in the world. I know that. Right, because it, yeah. it's and gangs seem such an innocent word for it because we're looking at drug cartels down there, and so um, part of the best crops they grow down there is cocaine, and. So the cartels are the ones that actually they're they've taken over the government, and so when anybody sends aids down aid down there in, in form of money or or seed or any kind of resources, usually what happens is they will hijack whatever the sources are and sell them on the black market so they can get more money from that, and so um, they're scavengers really, and that's why. Um, the death rate is so high because the, the, their form of government is not, you know, you are prove, you're innocent until proven guilty. You're just shot if you're thought you're guilty. So um, that's that can be part of the problem. So that we need to find a way to get resources down there that would not be intercepted by the cartels. Okay, and then of course you have your conclusion. You all know about that. I've given you a cup, uh, an example for a body paragraph. This is a two-chunk body paragraph, so you can see how it's constructed. Um, it's taking those two chunks that I showed you and putting them together to make the paragraph. Lourdes shows us the bond between parent and child is priceless, and no matter how poor a family may be, they should stay together. After Lourdes has been gone for two years, she's able to send the children clothes, shoes, toy cars, a RoboCop doll, a television. Working in the United States allows Lourdes to send financial support to her children, but Enrique's grandmother continues to tell him his mother will be home soon. However, she doesn't come, and that only makes Enrique angrier. Lourdes's motivation to leave Tegucigalpa 
Tegucigalpa was to give a better life to her children. But when Enrique finally reaches her 11 years later, he confesses to her how he sold the items she sent to him in order to buy glue to get high. She realizes her mistake. She cries, and then she feels too guilty to go on. Enrique convinces her that he did not need the clothes and the shoes and the gifts. He needed her, and that was much greater than his need for things. So there's a body paragraph. So you would need two of those plus your possible solution. That one doesn't have to be, you don't need kind of the evidence for that. Um, but what you could do is say how this might have solved this particular problem. So that third body paragraph doesn't have to be that long. It's just addressing that. Or if you can address each of your, in your uh, body paragraphs, you know, how this problem may have been solved uh, ahead of time. Um, you know, like if Florida had stayed, uh, they would find a way to find food. It was just too important to her to stay or something like that. Then you can address it in those body paragraphs. It does not have to be a separate third paragraph if you don't want it to be. So here are the dates. Um, I did change these in Canvas, so Canvas due dates should reflect these. It is going to kind of double up on the assignments that are running into the fourth module, so I apologize for that, but you guys all asked for an extra week, so I gave it to you. So the first draft will be due next Tuesday at 11.59 p.m., so there's some, there's some time there for you to work on it. And then the peer reviews, especially for you, Julian, will be um, – Monday, assigned Monday at 12 a.m. So again, you're going to want to make sure to get that first draft in so that it Canvas will send you a peer review. And this will help you to avoid those 15% deductions. The peer reviews are due uh, Tuesday at the end of the day, so 11.59 p.m. Okay, um, the peer review you're going to have these questions. So these are the questions coming from 3.5.5. And you're going to be answering the question, copying them and answering them on a Google Doc. And that is what you'll share. So what is the rhetorical purpose or function? Hopefully, um, it, it's the same answer for everybody. But I want you to look at the paper and see if this is actually what they did. Did they get their target audience? Um, what is the argument? So we want to make sure that it was an appropriate um, response to the question. Um, what types of evidence and appeals does this audience value mostly? Right. Does the writer use mostly ethos, pathos, or logos, or balance of each? Let's take a look at what I um, the evidence that what did I just do? Well. Um, let me take a look at the evidence that I showed you earlier, and we can kind of point out what type of evidence that would be. So the evidence up above this one, um, what type of evidence is this? Ethos, pathos, logos. <coughs> Everything that's read, is it ethos, pathos, or logos? Pathos? How so? How is it appealing to emotion? Because it's showing that Lourdes is trying her hardest to provide for them, even though she's not there with them. Right. Now, is that both of them? Yeah, because even though his mother keeps telling Enrique she'll be back, she doesn't actually come back. Okay, so that's this one, and that one indeed is pathos, so it's appealing to him because, you know, that if, if the parent is, uh, you could interpret this as Lourdes is lying to him, but I think there's a sincere, sincere effort for her to want to go home. She just can't because she can't afford it. That definitely is pathos, but what about this one? Cl clothes, the, the fact that she sends him the clothes, the shoes, the toys, the RoboCop doll, and the television. What, what kind of evidence is that? Is it stating fact? 
Is it stating um, somebody's expertise or is it appealing to the emotions? Emotion. You're still seeing emotion there. Okay. Now, you, it, there's no right or wrong answer, actually. I was looking at it more as logos, but when you combine the two, you definitely have pathos. Because, well, yes, wouldn't it be nice waking up Christmas morning and seeing the toys and the Robocop doll and the television, but what would it be if, uh, how would he feel if he were to open the door and there's his mother standing there? So taking the two together definitely would be pathos. Um, then um, this one, he confesses to her how he sold the items she sent in order to buy glue to get high and she realizes her mistake. What is, what kind of evidence is that? I think still pathos because mm -hmm. uh, it shows her, her emotion and like, I guess some people could see how hurt she could be. Right. Know? Yeah. So then your answer to this one in the peer review would be this. So this author uses primarily pathos with a little bit of logos to show the feelings and emotions that are behind um, the situation. So that would, that, that would answer the second bullet. Uh, how does the writer establish his or her own authority to address this issue? What credibility does she or he have with this audience? So um, you would look at it, somebody who writes a really good essay in this case, what, how do they need to be an authority? What should they be an authority about? Would it be like when they have certain statements or opinions, what evidence from the book yes. that is valuable mm -hmm. they to have, prove their claim? Yep. It's somebody who read the book. Can you tell when somebody has fake read themselves through a book? Do you know what I mean by fake reading? Yes. <laughs> everybody knows yeah. about fake reading because everybody's done it, including me, so don't feel bad. Um, so, and, and it, I realized, you know, it's, there are some books that I would love to be able to just stop in the middle of and say, I don't like this book. I'm not reading it anymore. Um, and, and that, you know, if you're reading for pleasure, well, let me ask you, if you were reading for pleasure, would you guys want to read this book? It was, if it was just, hey, I found this really interesting book. It's a sad story, but I think it's really interesting about immigration. Would you pick this up and read it? I would probably read the first few pages and get invested. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Good oh, so answer. Be, it, <laughs> Go ahead, Tara. Sorry. It wouldn't be too interesting to me at first, just like, just hearing it. But I think if I did read, read it, then yeah, I would, I would like it. Okay. And, and, and it's, you know, I... I liked it because it changed the way I thought. I think that's why I really liked it. So you can tell when somebody has not read the book because they don't have the evidence. They haven't thought about all of this. So what you're doing with this question is that have they established that they've read the book with enough evidence? That's, that's what you're responding to in this question. And then what are the most important factors contributing to either the success or failure of the argument? Do they have enough evidence? Have they connected the evidence for the reader? Does the reader understand how the evidence proves the claim? So it's kind of like, um, there's, is there an element missing here? If so, what is it? Or what did you really like about the essay that really seemed to be persuasive? And then what is the most relevant feedback I can offer about this audience in context? So remember this. Um, there are a lot of you out there who are very sweet and very nice and very encouraging. I really loved your essay. You made good points. That's a very nice thing to say. But remember what the purpose of this activity is. The purpose of this activity is to help the person get a stronger argument so that they can get a higher score and that they can they know that they've communicated appropriately so it is possible to provide them some feedback like um, 
perhaps if you connect how your evidence relates to the claim, um, you can get a higher score. You're not grading this, I am. But in your mind, as the listener, as the audience, how can you make this a stronger argument? Okay, and this, I wanna clarify this again, cause this is still giving a few people trouble. Um, when you have your Google Doc, and you're done with the with the uh, review. Uh, when you click the share button, you get this menu that pops up. You can either copy the link or get the shareable link. This is the default setting. Anyone at the Kern High School District with the link can view. So, so this is a link that anybody can open no matter who it is. This way you don't have to go looking for, well, who is my part peer review? I have to put their name down there. No, you don't. You just get this one and then everybody can see it, but it still will only be me and your partner. So you get that and then you're copying it in that box that says add comment. Okay, any questions about that? I think you three have successfully accomplished that, right? Everybody's yeah. Here. Yeah. Okay. So there are there any final questions on what you need to do about the book or anything else? Sounds like everybody's good then. Okay. So um, thank you all for joining today. It's a good conversation and I will get this posted, but you don't have to listen to it if you don't want to. <laughs> Uh, but the, the instructions are there if you need to go back at any time. So thank you, Julie and Tara and Naomi, and uh, good luck on this. Okay. Thank you. All Bye. right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay,